There he is. Hello, hello. Everyone <laughs> good? Everyone good? Hey, Matt. Yeah. Mic checks, mic checks. Good. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Yes. Okay. So um, let's get things started then. First of all, thank you to everybody out there who has tuned in to listen to us talk about um, basically the growth of UK free skiing and we're calling it grassroots to green shoots and it's a bit about kind of the development of the free ski scene in the UK, UK particularly freestyle and kind of where it was and how it's got to where it is now and um, joining me this evening we've got three guests uh, we've got Katie Summerhays, we've got Tyler Harding, we've got Pat Sharples all big figures within the UK freestyle ski, ski scene. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves um, and talk a bit about their skiing and what they've done. Um, but kind of the biggest link between us all, I think, is possibly Salomon. And we've got to say thanks to Salomon for bringing us all together and, and having this, this conversation. Um, but first off, let me introduce who I am. I'm Mark Watson. I work for Ellis Brigham. Uh, I used to be on the Salomon Free Ski team a long time ago, as well as the Ellis Brigham one. Um, but predominantly, I work on the ski hardware side of things now with Brigham's. Um, so let's get everyone introduced then. Katie, let's start with you. Tell a bit about kind of who you are, you know, any, 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 anything that you want to tell us about your skiing history as well. Uh, yes, I'm Katie. I'm 25 uh, from Sheffield. Um, yeah. Started skiing when I was six years old at the Sheffield Ski Village and obviously just loved it right away. Um, not just freestyle, just, just skiing in general. Um, and then I joined uh, the local ski club up there and pretty much has be, I've been hooked ever since. Um, I did racing, moguls, half pipe slope style, everything you could think of, um, but just took to freestyle for some mm. reason. Uh, not sure why I think it's just more free and you can do what you want and no rules as such but yeah, yeah just loved it since then and met Pat and Tyler probably about the same time I was 11 years old or maybe a bit younger um, on the Salomon Grom camps um, and that just really brought us together and yeah just went from there and um, I, I was just always always dreamt to be on the Salomon team and all my heroes in the like free ski scene we're all on Salomon so that's what I wanted and yeah I think I've been riding for Salomon since pretty much I was 11 years old um yeah excellent all right Tyler uh I'm from I'm Tyler Harding I'm 24 years old I'm from Halifax in West Yorkshire um I was skiing ever since I was about four or five years old um actually I was supposed to well I started out snowboarding but around that age I was too small so my dad got me in ski school because basically had to like shove me into ski school so him and my mum could actually have a snowboard holiday. <laughs> and that so, got me going with that. And then, I don't know, I, I skied a lot at Halifax and obviously there's people come from there like Jamie Nichols and Katie Omerod who are big figures in the snowboard scene. And I just kind of watched what they did and wanted to kind of replicate what they did on skis. And my dad kind of noticed it. And that's when he found out about Patch Chapel's Grum Camps. <laughs> and when I went there, I was like, oh my God, this is actually like, you know, this is a bigger thing than I, than I thought it was. I thought I was just, you know, going off a little jump and having fun at Halifax. And I went to uh, Rosendale and did some uh, Grum Camps for Pat when I was like eight years old and yeah. just kind of took off from there. I loved it. So here I am. Brilliant. Excellent. And uh, Pat, you've been around for a while now, so we'll have the slim down version, please. We haven't got all evening. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Mark. I, uh, <laughs> I won't say my age, but I am very old. But um, very much like uh, TJ and uh, Kate, I, I came from the dry slopes as well. My, my local dry ski slope was uh, Rosendale Ski Centre. There used to be a small little Ellis Brigham shop there as well, actually. I used to pop in there. My dad used to take me in every time after I finished skiing so I could look around at all the new equipment. But um, just just like, you know, those guys, you know, I, I got involved in just in all different aspects of skiing. It wasn't freestyle from the start. To be, to be honest, it was more alpine. I was just playing around on my skis and just having fun. And um, I, I then sort of played around with lots of different disciplines. But uh, one of my major ones was mogul skiing. 
Um, and uh, I uh, moved out to the mountains when I was 16 to try and find a job and support my sort of skiing, my ski career over there. And yeah. got more involved in the big mountain, free riding, um, as well as the mogul side of it. And um, I think I was incredibly lucky because I was right at the start of the whole free ski movement. You know, the industry was changing and the, uh, yeah. the equipment was changing. And the, 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 it was in 1996 that Solomon brought out the first twin tip ski, the Solomon 1080, the yeah. LM 1080 ski. It still makes me smile even when I see a picture of that now. And, yeah. um, and back country as well, the skis were getting wider. Uh, the technology was just, you know, improving massively. And it, to me, it opened up like a whole new world for, for me within skiing again. So like by the time I was in my mid twenties, it felt like I'd just stumbled on a whole new spot and it just got more exciting from there. Brilliant. Excellent. Okay. Um, just a quick one before we, we move on, just to let you know that we are on Facebook live and we're also on zoom. So get your questions coming in. I'm going to start off with a few. But feel free to, um, you know, post your comments, uh, questions in the comment section on Facebook um, and on Zoom as well. Um, we've got someone manning it, so I will get your questions. Um, we'll try and get them through to the guys. Okay, so Katie and Tyler, you probably did touch on this a little bit, but UK is not an obvious place to to kind of start freestyle skiing. So what what was it that that kind of really inspired you to pick up a pair of skis and actually have a go at, at you know doing some jumps and doing some rails. Katie, if we go to you first. Uh, so I yeah I joined the local ski club pretty much. I think the their only rule was that you had to get up the lift and get down yeah. pretty much. So yeah. yeah, as soon as I was six years old, yeah, we we joined that in uh, Sheffield Shark Ski Club, and yeah. um yeah, as part of their Saturday morning sessions, you did one hour on the main slope. So I work on yeah. your drills, your racing technique, and then one hour in the fun park. Um, yeah. So I was just in, like, I was aware of it from an early age, just going off the jump, doing tuck jumps, star jumps and all that. <laughs> uh, and then when you got a bit better and a bit older, you could go on Thursday nights yeah. where you either did two hours freestyle or two hours racing. Um, so I did a bit of both. I, I, I loved, I honestly loved racing. Uh, and I think if I would have done freestyle, I'd have still skied in some way. Um, so yeah, I, I just got involved with freestyle, but then when, as I got old, my, my parents made me go to the race training, which I, yeah, all my friends would be in the fun park and I'd be like doing my, going through the gates, which I love, but when all your yeah. friends are doing the cool tricks, I was a bit like, oh. Yeah, it's like but, I mean, I loved it then, I was still competing all the, all the, uh, all the racing stuff, but yeah, and then yeah, I don't know, it just kind of, and that's when I joined the Grand Camps, but while I was at the Grand Camps, I was still doing my race training. So it was only really when I was 13, 14, I think I went to World Championships or something for freestyle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but but up until then, I was doing kind of everything. Mogul's training as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. And yourself, Tyler, how about you? Uh, see, at Halifax, we didn't have anywhere to do any racing. So over there was literally just like one little, you know, a couple little drop-ins and then a jump or two two jumps. And there wasn't really a ski scene around there either. So I was growing up with a bunch of snowboarders, obviously Nichols and um, Katie Omrod to be two of them. And mm. I just kind of watched what they did. And I just thought it was really fun to do that because, you know, it, it was quite unique. It's still unique now is freestyle skiing. But back then I thought it was very unique as well. So it's something different to go out, you know, and express myself and, and learn and do. And I found that really fun. Yeah, and then when my dad found out about Pat Sharple's Grom Camps, like I just saw that there was 30, 40 other people all on the same slope, all doing the same thing. Yeah, and you know, yeah. and everybody was just loving it. Like back in the day when we did that, it was it was the best part of the week. Yeah. So that's what I got myself into every week or every fortnight, and I just never really looked back at that point. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so here's one for you, Pat. So looking at the the scene now. And kind of when you started, what are kind of the, the differences that you see between the two? <laughs> it, it is so different now. Like, it, it's hard to even compare. Like, when I got involved in free skiing or when free skiing started, should I say, yeah. you know, we, we were just experimenting. You know, this was even before your time, Mark, you know, with, with <laughs> 
There was uh, there was myself. There was Dave Young, the Godfather we call him of uh, GB free skiing. Jim Adlington, yeah. founder of Planks. There was a, there was a few of us, and it was almost like we'd have ideas in our head, you know, and think things through about tricks that might work. And it was almost like rocks is a paper, you know, to see who was going to go and try it. And normally, you know, once a week somebody would end up in hospital, pretty much. <laughs> Most of the time, normally Dave. Because, yeah. like, yeah, he sort of sends it a little bit more than the rest of us. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's just what it was. You know, there was, it, there, it wasn't really about events. It wasn't about anything else apart from it was more just try, try and fail for fun. That was it. And it was such <laughs> exciting times because you could be so creative. You know, the, the feeling you got when you learned a new trick. And th this was a time that the, you know, um, filmmaking, everybody could like, you know, the digital cameras and everyone could make their own ski movies as well. So yeah. we were looking at all our heroes within free skiing and, you know, we were almost like, well, we can try and make our own little ski movies. So we did a lot of that ourselves. And, you know, that was, that really pushed us on. That helped us really progress. It was just incredible times. I, I would, like, I feel so lucky that I was a part of that first movement. Brilliant. Excellent. So, you know, I think, I think for you, you, what you're saying there about, you know, freedom of expression and things like that, that was a real driver back then. Um, and I think it is now, but I think the level of tricks is, is crazy. I remember getting Ski Movie 1 for a Christmas present. I just got into freestyle skiing, I got Ski Movie 1. And um, I remember, who was it? I can't remember the part. Um, who it was but they did a 900 and I was like mind blown you know that was a massive trick back then you're like oh my god it's like two and a half rotations but now the jumps are they're huge you know I don't think I could go off one of those jumps now and the tricks you know you're talking double triple inverts left and right and it you know that's almost standard really um, but that's that's scary and the risk for for injuries is pretty big so um, Tyler, this one, I'll put this one out to you and to you, Pat, afterwards. You know, talk us through the process about thinking about a new trick, going for a new trick. How do you approach that? Um, what's going through your head and how do you, how do you minimise risks? Well, one thing that you got to understand that when it comes to learning new tricks and such, everything's a process. You don't just learn something out of the blue um, without, you know, doing the setups to it or taking, you know, knowing what you're going to do. So the biggest thing about learning a new trick is knowing exactly what you're going to do in the air, how yeah. you're going to take off, the feeling of it, like start to finish and how you're going to land, how you're going to come out of the trick. And a lot of that comes down to a lot of different things. Like obviously in the UK now we have a lot of facilities, like we have trampoline places we can learn stuff on. We have Greystone in Manchester where we have trampolines, we have trampolines into a foam pit we have you know the ski ramp into the airbag and all that's all the sorts so you can like learn the kind of stuff leading up to a trick and then when you take it to snow you're like as ready as you could be to try it like obviously mm. there's still like the little bits and bobs that you know you kind of scared in the back of your mind that things can go wrong like even now like tricks that i've done for years i still sometimes have that kind of inkling in the back of my head that oh you know, this could go wrong, this could happen. But as long as you've done everything up to that yeah. and you feel confident enough in yourself to be able to do it, then, you know, you're, you're good enough to go. And I feel yeah. like that's the biggest part of it. Like a lot of, a biggest part of free skiing is confidence in yourself. Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, it's probably, it's different being a rider and doing those tricks, but as a coach, Pat, you know, you're responsible for these guys and, you know, it's their, their career ahead of them. So, so kind of what's your, your thought process? Does someone say to you, I want to try this? Or do you have kind of like a, a list of things that, you know, tricks that you're looking for that you know are going to get good points and be able to put good runs together? I, I think Tyler really explained all of that incredibly well. Um, and rightly so, because, you know, he lives this from day to day. Mm. With, um, with like, with all our team, you know, they've all got their own sort of... Um, personal goals, like trick goals that they want to do. We build performance plans. And again, like Tyler said, you know, there's a process to doing that, to building up until you're ready to do it. And uh, 
for us as coaches, we just need to make sure that, you know, everything's in place to make it as safe as it possibly can, because the risks are so high anyway, that you just don't want to take any more chances um, or put them in uh, any more danger than that it already is going to be. And, yeah. uh, you know, again, like now what we do with a bit different to when we did the rocks is a paper where I said with me and my friends just to go to <laughs> hospital all the time. Now, you know, we, we try and minimize the risk all the time. So again, uh, strength and conditioning is huge. You know, we make sure that the guys are, you know, they're in the best shape possible, that they can take the hits, that yeah. they've got the power to actually perform these tricks, but also, you know, being able to take the crashes as well, because it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, make sure that we get the right facilities, the right jumps, the right spec. The, you know, for some of our athletes use the airbags. We've got our airbag out in Lavinia, which speeds up that progression for some of the bigger tricks. Not everybody yeah. likes those. You know, that's another thing. Like, you know, they can be dangerous as well. Like Katie, you know, she injured herself just before the Olympics, you know, and mm. uh, really badly on the airbag. And, you know, we'd have probably been better not using the airbag for when she was working on some tricks. But we do. We just try and minimize it as much as possible. And again, creating the right environment that they feel comfortable to try these new tricks. You know, mm. we talk it through, make sure that they can visualize it. You know, they feel confident about it that we know their sets are correct. Um, and then we give them the encouragement when we feel that they're ready to go with them. Okay, brilliant. So we've got a question in from Trish in Basingstoke who asks, um, when do you start preparing for the Olymp When you start preparing for the Olympics, do you change your routines and do you change the way you kind of set up for training? Um, Katie, you wanna take that one? say yes and no like obviously like we've just started olympic season now um so our our first event which was last month was the first olympic qualifier so of course you go into that a bit a bit differently because you've got a lot more on the line like you need to get those results to qualify and get those points to qualify but for me like competitions competition i want to do as well as i can do in mm. everyone i enter um or or come away with the best one and I know I, I could have done at the time because obviously it's so weather dependent and all, and all these things yeah um but yeah I don't know it's just just obviously you do have that in the back of your mind like oh I need to get the points I need to get a certain result to help my qualification for the Olympics um yeah so yeah we're all currently going through that right now <laughs> brilliant so I think it's one thing that I noticed when you guys are talking is you're using the term athlete it was never an athlete back in the day when I was skiing you weren't kind of talking about being an athlete you know you were a skier a rider that kind of thing but athlete is it's kind of almost symbolizes like the, the pinnacle of like um sporting performance almost and um we used to have the x games um back in the day and that was always like the pinnacle now you've got the olympics pat how much of an how much of um like a, an influence, do you think uh, having freestyle skiing as an Olympic sport has actually helped progress everything and kind of bring things up? Re really good question, Mark. Um, oh, and my honest answer, I'm not quite sure. Like, I, I think if you ask many of the top athletes still now, free skiers, I, I yeah, yeah, we do use the term athlete more because they've sort of got to be an athlete for what they're actually doing and what they're performing now you you can't be as free and laid back and have that cruisy lifestyle where you can be partying all night and not taking care of yourself and yeah. you know perform at the level that you need to and um, so they do need to have to be more athletes but yeah with the x game side of it i think if you asked them, a lot of them they would still sort of say it's the pinnacle of our sport you know that's the one if you'd say which one would you prefer to win i think some of them would you know, they'd struggle to decide if, you know, if you ask, you know, James Woodsy Woods, I, I still don't know which his answer would be. I think maybe <laughs> X Games slope style, you know, like he's won X Games big air, but he'd be like, oh, um, yeah. so it's just a bit different because X Games is every year um, and it's invite only where the Olympics is only every four years. And it's such a big event and you're there, you're competing for your country, you know, the whole qualification process, it's really stressful. It's, it's not easy to actually make it into the Olympics, um, especially from the UK. It is really tough. Like, you know, Katie's made the last two Olympics and done incredibly well at them, you know, and like Tyler's Olympic journey, you know, I'll tell you himself up to Pian Chang, like the, the challenge on that, it was tough to be in the top 30 in the world 
to actually get in there is is not easy. You know, you would need to be at every event. You need to be performing at a high level, be consistent. You know, it, it's pretty challenging. Um, where X Games, you get a shot once every year. But again, if you get invited, and then that's it's a little bit different. It's a bit of a popularity competition sometimes with the X Games. So, yeah, just they're very, very different. Okay, brilliant. And then in terms of funding, you know, being an Olympic process event do you do you see more kind of from government help and things like that do you get more kind of cash injection we yeah we get backed by uk spot which um is the part of the national lottery as well a lot of the national lottery funds that go into that and uh they look after us incredibly well but you know we had to earn that or should i say you know the team had to earn that yeah. So when we were going back before Sochi and uh, it, this was going back in 2012 when we found that free skiing, slope style and half pipe were going to be included in the 2014 Sochi Olympics. We didn't have any funding like, you know, uh, I, I, this is when I was working as the Solomon team manager. Um, we were still doing lots of stuff on the dry slopes. We, we, we got included in the first world championships. And I think me and my wife, Vanessa, we, we took, it was actually Katie and Woodsy. And there was, I think, Murray Buchan, uh, James Machen, uh, Emma Longsdale. We, we all went out to the world championships and we used that, me and Vanessa used our holiday fund, I remember, to head out there and take the guys out. And that's when we, it sort of opened our minds. We're like, you know, we could do actually really well at this. And we asked to see if we could get any funding. And they were like, well, no, you need to show that you're going to be, you've got to be podium competitive before we could ever give you any funding. So we had to go and show and prove that we were podium competitive. Get any funding. And that's exactly what we did. Um, Woodsy got a podium at the X Games, his first X Games. KT was getting podiums at World Cups. And then uh, same snowboarders were doing very well. Jenny Jones at the time was doing incredibly well. Jamie Nichols, Billy Morgan. So then we sort of came together and we put in a proposal to UK Sports and then the, they, they gave us government funding through, through uh, the National Lottery and that sort of got our foot in the door and we've gradually progressed on. And the more successful you are and the more po podium competitive you are with more athletes, the more funding you're entitled to. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in from some of the guys out there watching. We've got Tom. Uh, maybe Tyler, put this one to you. Uh, what's Tom saying? Tom asks, do you ever use the indoor snow domes or do you prefer plastic to train on? And if so, why? Uh, it depends because um, the indoor domes are very rail kind of. Like if you want to go and do rails, the indoor domes are very good for that. Like they mm. have, you know, little jumps there, but the rail setups that they'll set up are really good. And me and Katie, literally, when we get home, the first thing that we'll text each other when we get home is, do you want to go to Cass? Or, <laughs> yeah, you know, they you opened know. It after lockdown, we were straight there every week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's what we went and straight did because, you know, it's, re it's really good even for, like, you know, at any level because rails, you know, a rail's a rail. You can learn stuff on it. You can have fun with it. Mm. And we'll go there for a laugh. But then when it comes to um, plastic and outdoor stuff, obviously there's places around the UK that have really good jumps. So there's Halifax, which has a decent jump. There's Besden. Um, so, and there's Rosendale as well. So it's like different, you know, you can use it for different things basically. But yeah. in any case, we'll just go to wherever if there's gonna be, you know, well, me and Katie will show up no matter what, but hopefully we can get like a crew together and just have a good time. Because thing is we enjoy the sport. Like we're not, it's not, obviously it's not a job for us. It's what we you know what we do to have fun it was a hobby that turned into like you know a career yeah. so we're still going to go out there and have fun and have a laugh and work on stuff and yeah, yeah that's that's what we like to do so both mm. basically okay cool katie so here's one for you scott asks um he says you're all sponsored by salomon do you ever get involved in any product um creation or design or, and, you know, will we ever see a, a Katie or a Tyler limited edition ski? I don't know. That would be the dream, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, I don't even know what I'd do. Uh, but no, I'm no, texting not Solomon so right now. Yeah, <laughs> I want my ski. Uh, but no, yeah, we, are, we always feed back what we think of the skis. And um, yeah, I mean, we've both been on them for 
10 plus years so i think that speaks speaks for itself yeah uh, a couple sorry a couple of years ago woodsy well salomon went to woodsy and asked like how we how we could improve the salomon ski like mm-hmm. you know as the technicalities of it so woodsy actually gave he skied them as well but he also gave me a pair of skis that they like a prototype that they made basically to like test it out and see how it is yeah and I, I had the most fun on them Paris skis ever. And they actually changed them the next year to this kind of better design. It was a, and yeah, so we've had a little bit of input here and there, but that's really cool. Like I'm really stoked to be a part of Solomon and the fact that they care that much that they're able to come and talk to us about stuff like that. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Um, so we mentioned the Olympics a couple of times. Um, I think what I'd really like to know from your perspective, both of your point of view is like what what goes on in your head on an olympic run day what what are you thinking about what are you focusing on you know where's your headspace oh bloody everywhere <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. you know, it's just crazy because you work so much for that moment and then it just appears and you've got two runs in qualification that you've literally worked four years for and it's just over like that like my brain just switches off when i'm going down the slope Obviously, it, in a good way, but I just get to the bottom and I'm like, did I do that? Like, <laughs> like obviously, I know if it's good or bad, but I'm like, I just go into autopilot. But I don't know, like, me and Pat just stand. I remember at the last couple of, the last two Olympics, we just stand and we just stand at the top because obviously there's a bit a bit of a delay before you drop in. And we just, like, say, like, oh, like I'm just from Sheffield. Like, how crazy is this? Like, we're just looking out over the mountains and, yeah, just mind-blowing just how far we've all come yeah I think that, that was that was the craziest bit when I was at the Olympics and I was in the start gate with Pat and then I kind of looked up and it was like you know a drone or a helicopter or something in the sky that was filming and I was <laughs> like oh my gosh like that like I've seen shots of the Olympics and stuff like that from that exact spot and I've been at my tv at home watching through that camera or a yeah. camera like that and I was like actually it's me now I'm the one at the top of the slope <laughs> and I the, the, the Olympics is different, I would say, than when it comes to like World Cups and stuff. When I was at the Olympics, it was just pure excitement. Like there was there was obviously like nerves because like Katie said, it's only two runs. Like yeah. you could practice the same run a hundred times, but if you don't do it inside two runs when it counts, then you know you're gonna you're gonna go home feeling upset about it. But the Olympics was just different. It had that feel to it. Everybody was super happy to be there. Like the nerves were way down. And it was just such a fulfilling experience. Like that whole year and a half just paid off for sure. Not, not even that. Sorry. The last however long that we've been training for it, like it's just paid off. Excellent. I could I can only imagine what that's like. Um, so obviously it's been a, a tricky year. Um, it's probably one that a lot of people would like to put behind them. But um, Pat, what, what have been like the major challenges for you this year dealing with everything that's going on? Sorry, I'm getting all emotional just hearing my guys. Like, <laughs> all grown up. Like, it has. It's just been the most insane journey. Like, I, you know, I'm just sort of reliving it through. So thanks so much for doing this because I'm just like, wow. Like, it has. It's just been... I, I've not, you know, give up this for anything. It's just been the most magical journey. Anyway, sorry, no, this year, um, oh, it's every every day is a challenge, Matt. So um, we, we've got an incredible team at GB Snow Spot who work behind the scenes. We've got our program managers. We've got our Olympic team manager and everybody who sort of, you know, is involved in the planning, the logistics of everything. So we, 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 we've constantly looking about little loopholes of where we can go for training you know obviously the top priority is keeping uh, all our athletes and our coaches support staff safe mm-hmm. um uh, things are getting closed down weekly competitions are getting cancelled weekly um but i feel in the last sort of six months we've sort of navigated through all of this a bit like ninjas you know we've, we've done a pretty <laughs> good job but when we first went into lockdown and you know we, we were back in the uk and where like a lot of our fellow, fellow competitors, they're, you know, locked down, but they're locked down in the mountains somewhere and they've yeah. got access to snow. So we said, right, okay, well, what are we going to do that's going to be different that can have a positive impact? So 
the, the basically the plan was we'll make sure that all, all our athletes have got um, a clear strength conditioning program that's um, uh, designed for them individually, make sure that they've got all the equipment that they need. They can take this time to rest mentally as well as physically where normally they'd be at training camps throwing themselves around. So we've sort of said, right, let, let's use that time wisely to sort of relax properly, really refresh. But let's mm -hmm. come out of the lockdown better, fitter and stronger and faster than we were when we went into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody did. It really did. And as soon as we've seen everybody back on snow, they have been better than where they were when they left off. Like that plan worked really well. Again, yeah. you know, within an organization now, we're very lucky. We've got world-class strength conditioning coaches, world-class physios. You know, we've got nutritionists access uh, to access to get information on from there. So we, again, because of UK sport, we're lucky that we can put all the support around the guys to give them everything that they need. And yeah. even that time where we didn't get on snow, where a lot of our fellow competitors did, I felt like we still had, you know, we made some real good progression by just good planning right through all of this. Excellent. Brilliant. It sounds like they've got it sorted then. <laughs> um, so obviously you've got the skiing, you've got the training that goes with it, you know, mental, physical, but also you've got to think about what you're on as well, what's strapped to your feet and what your feet are actually in. And um, it's probably one for all of you, really. How important is, is kit, you know, having the right kit? Um, how do you make sure you've got the right kit? Is there like a piece of kit that you just, you couldn't live without? And do you have like a, a lucky, a lucky charm as it were? Let's start with Katie. Uh, no, no so much lucky charm, I don't think. Um, but yeah, no, I just, obviously I, I use a Salomon NFX and um, yeah, I mean, I've been on them as long as they've been a model. And before that it was a suspect and before that it was girls Mai Tai. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've just used Salomon since I was 11 and uh, obviously I've got confidence in them and I know that they're going to get me down safely. And yeah. yeah, on the icy days, they are so good. They charge through slushy days. Yeah, brilliant as well. So I must have a lot of trust, trust in them. And yeah. also just to, I mean, Salomon was my dream sponsor growing up. Um, so to still be riding for them now is like pretty mind blowing. Cool. Excellent. Tyler, like, what is it maybe that, you, that you're looking for in your kit that you absolutely, you know, the ca characteristics that you can't live without? Uh, for me, it's just comfort. Like, I feel like when it comes to skiing, you ski your best when you're comfortable, mm -hmm. not just in like, you know, in terms of kit, but also, well, yeah, in terms of kit, but as in comfort, but also like feeling good as a whole. Like, I remember like just two days ago, I felt like something wasn't up with my skis and I was like thinking to myself, like, I don't, you know, I don't feel comfortable enough to do certain things. Yeah. And, and then I had to like, you know, go and have a look at them, see if they were all right, you know, change um, the forward pressure or something on them. And after that, I just felt really good again. Yeah. So it's just about being comfortable in the kit that you have. And just like Katie said, I've been on Salomon since I was nine years old. And I love Salomon so much that when I was too big for the kids version, but too small for the male version, I had to use the women's Mai Tais, which yeah. was like, obviously like a step <laughs> in between. Yeah. I remember Katie used to take the mick out of me all the time because I was wearing girl skis. But again, it's all about comfort. Like I was stoked because they didn't break on me. They were the right size. And it's just the same again now. Like I'm skinny and effects and, I see a lot of pe different people being like, oh, I could never ride Salomon skis, but I love it. I love where I'm at. And yeah, don't have any lucky charms though. Maybe <laughs> I should look into that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll sell you a couple, mate. We've got loads in Brigham's. Oh, man. <laughs> if, you could, if you could actually send an order out to me right now, I'll send you my, I'll send you my address. Yeah. Pat, <laughs> how about yourself? How important with, you know, is kit to you and you know, making sure your guys are on the right kit? Well, like... It obviously hugely important, you know, like for, for those guys, it's, it's like, you know, making sure um, a racing driver has got the right, you know, car to use to perform at its highest level. And, um, you know, Solomon have always provided us like the, in, the incredible kit, you know, for, for our team. They, they really have. But, you know, even for myself, like I, I remember back in the day, um, 
oh, I've been buying Solomon skis. As soon as Solomon started making skis, I started buying Solomon skis. Um, and when I was getting into moguls and big mountain skiing, and I used to be buy the old Force Nines, probably nobody will even remember those. Uh, very narrow, long 195 skis. And, was know, I born by then? They, 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 that was back in 1931, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> painful, so just, painful. A, just a couple of years off then. Yeah. <laughs> and then, again, it, it's been so exciting to be a part of, you know, that whole revolution of that big change and just how the equipment's changed. And it's kept me excited and been, it kept me involved in the sport where the sports felt like it's changed massively into a totally different sport than it was when I first got into it. Um, like I said, with the, with the twin tips when they came out in 1996 and the big mountain skis with the rock, uh, rocker technology that's all come through. Uh, and for me, as, like, as an aging skier, I still ski is still my favorite thing to do in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily jump on my NFXs and go and sort of hit the jumps and stuff much anymore unless... Tyler and Katie make me do it. Um, <laughs> sometimes still do. Hey, you know, you know the coach's rule. You know the coach's rule. One What's the coach's rule? Year. Uh, One flip per year. That is oh. it. In some years, yeah. Pat tries to leave it until the end, so you'll think that we'll forget about it. We <laughs> never forget. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm glad I'm not the yeah. coach. Uh, but for me, now, like I love that what Solomon have done, like it has been a big change recently. I think, you know, everybody knows that, you know, like the, the, the free skiing, the freestyle aspect of it has definitely quietened down to the general market yeah. where the backcountry, you know, touring equipment's really sort of shot up in popularity. And I think a big part of that is because, you know, people can relate to that more, you know, it's more accessible. Mm -hmm. I think, Free skiing has got so, uh, it's progressed so fast. And the tricks that everybody's doing now, a lot of people can't get their heads around. No. You know, it's not just too much. Everyone's like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. But you know what? Yeah. I can go and ski the backcountry there and get some nice powder turns and I can get this kit. So I totally get it. And, and it's the same for me, really. I can't do what those guys are doing. And, you know, it, it appeals to me more now to sort of, put my QSTs on, you know, and uh, go and ski some nice power. Okay, brilliant. Um, so we're going back to some questions from some of the viewers. We've got Olivia. She says, thanks so much uh, for this, guys. Really enjoying this chat. You're all really inspirational, and I'll make sure my six-year-old watches this. I love, uh, I'd love to be her ripping up the slopes in years. To, I'd love to see her ripping up the slopes in years to come says, my question is, what's a typical training day look like? Um, let's go, Katie, because you're at the top of my screen. Well, tomorrow is going to be a typical training day. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'll probably wake up at um, 7 o'clock, and then we usually leave 8.30, 8-ish. Uh, obviously, head straight up the mountain, um, go uh, have a good breakfast, obviously, before, because uh, it's bloody freezing up there, so... Yeah. to make sure we're well fueled um yeah do a good warm up at the top of the hill and then yeah ski i think we ski mm -hmm. here till one o'clock so from nine to one yeah. pretty much yeah. ski through and then um yeah come back down um pretty much grab some lunch straight away and then have a chill out for a bit and then usually we've got physio um snc it's obviously looking a bit different at the minute because of covid so we're we can't go to the gym like we would do and we can't go to the trampoline park because obviously we want to minimize the risk of coming into contact with loads of different people but yeah, yeah usually we would ski morning into the afternoon come down have something to eat and then physio gym trampoline and then do it all again the next day brilliant yeah. excellent uh anything to add to that tyler or is it all pretty uh, much like similar things for for all the different riders or have you all got your own routines it's pretty much what Katie said, but like it kind of differs between where we are. Like currently, um, St. Moritz, the sun like sets behind the mountains at like half 12. Right. So like the light actually leaves like the jumps and the landing. So you can't really see much. That's really so good. So that's why we end around 12, 30, 1 o'clock. But yeah. we just spent um, three weeks in uh, Austria at Prime yeah. Park Sessions. And that would go all the way until like two or three. You know, we, we would be going down the mountain at about 3 p.m. And it'd be a longer session. So in that day, you know, you'd take a, you'd take a longer break and 
have a good lunch up there and you know you just work on certain stuff in the morning and then work on stuff in the afternoon or you'd chill in the morning do all your harder stuff in the afternoon yeah you know it, it kind of differs from where you are but while we're here we're kind of getting up there trying to get stuff done as quick as possible then come down and you know as Kate said get physio do a bit of gym work in the bedroom we, you know we all bring like therabands with us and foam rollers and other yeah. stuff so that we can actually do a bit of you know keep ourselves ticking over but yeah it's a you know it's a daily thing excellent okay so we've probably got time for three more questions we've got two from some uh, some of the viewers um so i'll just chuck this out to all of you um so sophie she's asking where's your favorite place to ski in the world and why brackets is it castleford I mean, I don't think much great, could beat it. <laughs> yeah, great place in the UK. Quick claps. <laughs> Big up Cas Vegas. Uh, I think my favourite place to ski is Cadrona in New Zealand. Um, that was one thing I was going to miss out on this summer. I think it would have been my sixth year in a row or something. Um, I just, I just love the place. Love New Zealand. The skiing's great. Uh, the people are really nice. We always go for like two months or something, so we get a good training block. Um, and there's loads to do. I think last time I went, I went skydiving one day after skiing. So, Oof. yeah. <laughs> Casual come down from skiing. Got yeah, exactly. Adrenaline yeah. junkie. <laughs> you know what I mean, you definitely got Red Bull in your veins. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, so when, when you asked that question, I immediately thought of Cardi's, which is where Katie said. Um, I think mostly just because of the views. Like we stay in Wanaka over there, and Wanaka is some of like the best views that you, you know that I've ever seen. And that part of the world is amazing. But if, if it was my, if I was going to stay somewhere for a whole season, it would be Lax, because Lax is somewhere we've all grew up. You know, kind of skiing. Like the British Championships have been there since Pat probably knows, but mm. a long time. The, since I can remember, the first ever Brits that I went to was in Lax when I was quite young. And we'll still go there every single year just because the skiing is great, not just the jumps, but also the rails. And it's also just really good vibes out there. Like there's a good set of people always out there. Everybody's always in a good mood. It's sunny, it's slushy in the end of the season. So you can just have fun and throw throw your carcass about, you know. <laughs> it's, it's really good for training, but it's also really good just to, you know, cut about with the boys and have a good yeah. time. Brilliant. So Pat, you've been about a bit. What about you? Uh, 100% Carcheval in France, in the Free Valleys. You know, like, um, it just, it's such a special place for me. It's like my second home. Um, I, I turned up there when I was 16 years of age with uh, no money, nowhere to live, nothing. Didn't really know what I was doing. And I ended up living there for 14, 15 years. It's like, I class it as like my university, you know. I sort of got there and I sort of learned all about life. I learned about skiing. I learned about the mountains. I, I met you know, Vanessa, who's now my wife, you know, and again, uh, I had lots of ups and lows. I, you know, really pushed hard to uh, try and make it with mogul skiing down the whole Olympic route. You know, I had a lot of serious injuries with uh, knee injuries, moved into the free ski movement as that all came along and then developed when I got a bit past my uh, sell-by date as a professional skier, moved into the coaching and uh, you know <laughs> that all happened within Carcheval and the memories I've got there is just second to none and it's probably one of the greatest ski areas that I have still ever skied and I feel like I've skied pretty much most places in the world right now. So yeah, yeah Carcheval for sure. Fantastic. Pat, you don't look a day over 30. <laughs> Thanks, DJ. I'll give you that <laughs> <tenor> later on. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of people out there looking at these pictures that are popping up thinking those jumps they're monstrous like that seems like a, a mile away like some people won't even, might not even try to jump yet so if I want all of you just to give one piece of advice to any kind of budding freestylers out there what would be kind of the, the key piece of advice that you'd give to him, Katie? Uh, have fun, hundred percent. Like that's that's the main thing, and that's still what what we we'll, what we do. I mean, we'll go up tomorrow and have a laugh and fun when we're training. Um, but yeah, get a good crew and have fun. Yeah, excellent, yeah, Tyler. I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Like everything is kind of a process. You know what I mean? Like you can't 
you know, every day you're kind of working on something new and building up, you know, to get to that next step. But as long as you're having fun along the way, you're going to progress. You know yeah. what I mean? You're going to progress faster because it's, you know, you're never going to progress doing something that you just don't enjoy. And again, we turned our um, hobby into our career now. And we did that just by having fun the whole time and working hard. But again, go, going up the next day and just knowing that you're going to be skiing most of the day with a smile on your face. Unless you screw up a trick and throw your poles like I do. But that only happens. <laughs> Dummies on out the pram. Time. That, that only happens on a 10 to 15% basis, but you know, the rest of the time we're having a good time, boys. <laughs> Excellent. Pat, from a coach's point of view. Uh, you, you know what? They've just said it all perfectly. That, that, that's it. it. It's about having fun, you know, obviously be committed, work hard, you know, of, uh, just enjoy it. When that's when the magic happens, when you're having fun and you're enjoying it, you know, when you're not, it just doesn't. So yeah, go yeah. out there, have fun. Brilliant. Excellent. So up on the screen now is everybody's Insta handles and, and Facebook uh, addresses. So if you want to check out these guys progress it throughout, throughout the season, see how they're getting on, then uh, just follow the, the uh, addresses on the screen. There's a little typo on Katie's one. She's uh, not got an at at the end of her Instagram handle. Um, but thanks for joining us this evening, guys. And uh, it's been it's been really really great chatting to you and learning a bit about what goes on and where you started from and where you are now. Um, and I just guess it remains for me to say good luck with the rest of your season. Thanks to Salomon as well for for bringing us all together. Um, and uh, if it's not too early, maybe Happy Christmas. Thank you so much, Mark. This has been incredible, by the way. Really appreciate it. And it's just brought back so many amazing memories. And, and again, big up to Solomon. You know, like I, I sort of said this, that they helped us create or let me sort of set up this new free ski team within Solomon uh, back in the day. And that's been a natural progression of what's happened now with the GB free ski team. Everybody has progressed on that journey, you know, and uh, without them, backing us and supporting us back in the days. I'm not sure if it would be where it is today. So again, big props to Solomon and Ellis Brigham. Thank you so much, guys. No worries at all. Big all up right. Solomon, the boys. Big up Ellis Brigham, the boys. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank Excellent. you. Love, that. Excellent. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you want to kind of have a look at kind of more freestyle orientated stuff, whether it's products, riders stuff, or a bit of kind of lifestyle stuff, uh, check out Ellis Brigham Free Ski. Um, but I'll leave you guys to enjoy the rest of your evening and do what dads have to do and do what athletes have to do. <laughs> right. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, boys. Thank you.